All right. So welcome, everybody. We're going to throw our first night hacking panel interview. Hope you guys are enjoying your lunch and had some good sessions after the keynote. Um, with me, I have several panelists who will will introduce shortly. We're going to try to divine if the internet is really ready for devices or not, because there's certainly a lot of hype about it. I'm sure you guys have heard things. Um, we have folks on an online stream. What you see up behind me is exactly the same thing, which is being broadcast at nighthacking.com. So we have a bunch of folks watching this live from the live stream. Um, they're going to be interacting via Twitter, via hashtag nighthacking. So we'll post questions from those guys. Um, obviously, if you're in the room here, you don't have to use Twitter to interact. You can just um, come closer to the stage and ask your questions directly to the panel, and I'll, I'll repeat it for folks on the stream. So, sound good? You guys ready for the panel session? Yeah? Okay, we, we need to add filler applause there, so. <laughs> All right, so just to set the stage, the Internet of Things, which, which is all about devices and um, small embedded things that can communicate, um, interface with the Internet, with back-end cloud services, and change the way that people are um, interfacing in their lives with um, wearable electronics and different things, it's received a lot of, of hype in industry analysts protecting 10 billion devices and more coming up. Um, if you look at all the companies investing in it, even here in the pavilion, they have the Lego Mindstorms over there, which runs an ARM processor. Um, I know for at Oracle, we're doing a lot of work on Embedded. And there's also some other device manufacturers here which build chips. So the question is, is everybody ahead of the game? Are they trying to put money into something which isn't quite ready yet? Or is this actually a technology which you can apply today and, and actually make use of? So we got some practitioners here, folks who actually work on the technology. And we're going to chat with them today and see what their opinions are about the state of embedded and Internet of Things technology. So starting on my um, left here, Garrett Grunwald, would you care to introduce yourself? Yeah, I can introduce myself shortly. So, um, yeah, I'm a software engineer, studied physics, working for Canoe Engineering in Switzerland. And uh, I came to the IoT thing just because I'm interested in the physics behind it and in the semiconductor stuff. And it was just natural to use Java uh, to, to code for that uh, kind of devices. So, so, that's so it was a, a happy accident. Yes, <laughs> very happy. <laughs> All right, yeah. Mark. Hi, my name. Hello, my name is Mark Hecklover. I am a Can software you? engineer with Oracle. Uh, work out of the St. Louis, Missouri, USA office. All right, Mike, let him borrow yours. And that was going so well until then. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a software engineer with Oracle. Work out of the St. Louis, Missouri, uh, USA office. I uh, work more on the server side of Java, but uh, the Internet of Things has uh, become a passion of mine. So I've been, uh, as we said in our talk earlier, kind of pressing against all of the edges I could find to see where they lie and see how far out we can push them. So that's, in a nutshell, it. Hey. I'm Jose Pereda. I'm from Spain. I work at the university in Valladolid. I'm an engineer, but my passion has been for several years coding and uh, applying this uh, coding to actual projects, real projects and in the industry. So uh, besides, besides that, I, I tried the embedded stuff for many long years in this uh, industry environment. And now uh, I have the pleasure to share my uh, hobby hours with Mark, playing with the Raspberry Pi, the, du the Arduino, and all the, all the things we can find in the IoT environment. Cool. Uh, I'm Joachim Eriksson, working at uh, the Swedish Institute of Computer Science with networked embedded systems, uh, like these ones, really small devices. Uh, I'm developing uh, low-level C our, our most C of the days. held up a device. You have to tell us what you, what you held up there. This is a 
Cortec M3 based really small system on chip with built in radio. So in this, you have 256K of uh, program memory and 16K of ROM, which is a huge device for me, a small for anyone else. Uh, but here you can run a full IPv6 stack, routing protocols, web server, and more or less anything you like. Soon, I hope, Java also. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm working with this on a daily basis, low level C, but also on the gateway side and cloud side, of course, Java and other technologies also. Okay. So just to set the stage, um, so you have some devices, Jose, which you'd like to demonstrate to us and give, give us an idea of what sort of things you're showing here. Help him with the mic while he's sure. showing okay. devices. Uh, for starters, most of you should know by now about the Raspberry Pi. Okay, this is a Raspberry Pi within a, a case and a camera. It's a very little tiny camera, but it's five megabytes of resolution. It's really huge resolution for this device. Okay, this is an Arduino. Most of you will know about our, an Arduino, for sure. Uh, we have this morning the keynote with David Quartuelles, one of the creators of the, of the Arduino project. So this is another tool from Italy. It's an Open Picos project. And this is a flyport with Ethernet and web server embedded. So you can uh, apply many seals to build something more uh, sophisticated with your, uh, with your boards. So these are Ethernet seals, and these are uh, ZigBee protocol uh, antennas, and the seal for plugging into the Arduino. Well, um, I, have, uh, I have plenty of these at home and play with them. But you know, uh, there are many, many things, many devices out there, and maybe Gerrit will tell us about uh, all the devices he has at home. Well, you know, so uh, the, the IoT that I use is. Uh, for Joachim, it's more super supercomputer size. So <laughs> it's in the gigahertz range, dual core CPUs. You have megabytes of RAM. You can run a Java SE, which is uh, with JavaFX support. So this is uh, nothing that will run on these uh, very tiny Cortex M3 devices. But um, the hurdle to, to start with is so low that every Java developer can really easily start to, to code with that stuff, and that, that makes it so much fun. In principle, this is not new technology. It, this is things we, we knew for years, but now it's so small and so cheap that you can just buy it and attach some sensors or actors at home, and that, that's the fun part of it. And that's where I started with this. Uh, so I, there are different devices on the market right now, like uh, BeagleBone Black or QB Board or I don't know. There are, lots of devices which have several uh, similar um, specs and that you can buy for around 30 to 40 bucks. All so right, so here's a, a question for the panel. Actually, one of the, one of the folks online, um, Jim Weaver, asked us a question over Twitter and he was interested what sort of cool projects that you guys are working on. Um, and I think this is really directed, it sounds like, like you guys are the, the hobbyists. You're, you're kind of hacking and playing with the technologies. And, and it sounds like you actually have real industrial applications which are applying the embedded technology you're working for. So let's start with a, a, a good hobbyist. What are you doing, Garrett? OK, so first of all, I, I also worked as an engineer for the semiconductor industry. And there I used also embedded technology based on Java using the sunspots, which are a little bit old now, but uh, also ARM-based. And I used them to monitor the temperature and other values inside of a semiconductor lithography tool and to monitor the temperature and visualize it on my desktop. So um, I have a little bit experience of this professional usage, usage of uh, IoT, but at home I'm using it mostly for monitoring temperatures, humidity, pressures. I have some actuators to switch on off light and all that stuff. So location awareness I'm now working on. The interesting thing is you can combine this, all these technologies suddenly just on your desktop using these small devices talking to each other. So that's what I'm doing. It's too many things to go into detail. <laughs> so I think these guys have more detailed information. Well, I guess, um, yeah, Jose and I have been working together on... Closer? Okay. Jose and I have been working together on a couple of different things, uh, but the, probably the most fun one has been 
uh, putting together a renewable energy system that is monitored and managed by an embedded system uh, using Arduinos, Raspberry Pis as clients and remote concentrators, pushing as much as far down the platform scale size as we can, even putting a Java EE web profile on a Raspberry Pi to run as a data server, uh, and using WebSocket to tie it all together to where we have a globally networked uh, system where we exchange data and record it live uh, throughout and control the system, lights, heat, uh, from anywhere. Uh, I also have just started working uh, recently on um, drone software and some auto uh, autonomous software for drones, so that's something I'm looking forward to getting more into um, after JFocus. So, uh, so you mentioned, you both mentioned that you're doing a lot of lighting and heating and things with your houses. So, what what happens when there's a power outage? <laughs> well, you learn the value of a good UPS. I guess that's the first thing. Um, in, in a lot of this, when you're testing new configurations, you try different things, you switch configurations around. And recently, we had a, a massive power outage where I was, and I had just changed my configuration to pull some things off the UPS and, and wound up scrambling and rebuilding some, some systems. Uh, but, uh, but the UPS helps smooth a lot of that out, as well as when you have a sufficiently large uh, storage array, battery storage array, then that can insulate you from a lot of that as well. But yeah, as with anything, good backups are a key. So, so it's kind of like the difference between manual car windows and electronic power? Yes, although I have to tell you, after that, I really seriously considered the hand generators for a hand while, generator. because at least that would have kept things going uh, when, when things got a little dicey with the UPS. So. Yeah, lesson learned. <laughs> so one of the most exciting projects I'm currently doing is to port this small operating system that we run on these really tiny microprocessors to, to, to one platform that happens to be inside this. So it's basically this plus a power switch and electrical metering. So this device runs the same software, Contiki OS, as we have in, in this kind of open electronics devices. And actually, it's going to be a released product soon. So it's going to be more than hype fairly soon, I would say, in more realistic so, devices. So do you see people having those devices all over their houses or this will, businesses or? This will probably be, I mean, we've seen a lot of these devices already selling quite a lot for smart home applications. And this will be the first generation of that. but. This time, all IP all the way to the devices, so you can actually ping your thing, basically. Uh, you can, um, in, in the long run, I think this will be built into the walls instead of actual additional sockets, because you, it would be nicer to hide it away. Uh, but also, we have some other projects more on higher levels, connecting different types of systems, like heating system, burglar alarms, um, ventilation so that these services can work together. Today, they're typically one service per system, which make them not really optimal. So you need to, when you kind of set, put on your burglar alarm, the heating system could start slowing down and the ventilation to avoid burning unnecessary energy. So there's a lot of interesting things when it comes to how to handle these, how to connect different types of services over, over the internet also. Okay, That's so you mentioned, you mentioned something interesting, burglar alarms, and that ties in with the general security concerns people have with um, Internet of Things. So if, you're, if your house is now on the Internet and it's communicating with different systems, if I'm a, a thief, can I just hack your house and then break through your security system? Sure. That's the problem. <laughs> it's actually, I mean... What we need is probably something even higher than typical credit card security, because that's easy to hack. You could guess numbers, security card numbers more or less today, and steal people's money. That's handled today, but it's worse if they turn off your heating system. So security will be a key issue. Before we have security, IoT will actually just be a hype. So it's, it's going to be very important. Cool. I had a, an experience with just a, a small example of what may happen. Because uh, in our demo, uh, we had all our devices at home working, 
So we, we, we tried to, to show them uh, working on the, on, the, on the slides. So for that, we need to get access to our home and open our router, open the port, so we can get uh, with BNC or SSH or whatever to our Raspberry Pi servers and so on. So when I was at home, I opened all the ports to test it. When I was working, I logged in and checked everything was working. But suddenly, one day, I couldn't get into my Raspberry Pi through a BNC server because there were really, it's true, there were several bots out there trying to get into this BNC port, which is a, a regular port, and the server blocked the connection because of the many attempts they were doing. So I have to change the, the, the number of the port to a different uh, random port to avoid that. But these things happen because there are <laughs> many, many uh, bots out there scanning for ports and everything like that. So <laughs> you want to add something here <laughs> about security? <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> OK, so we've talked a lot about different devices which, which you can use. So one of the questions, we have a, we have a lot of Java hackers. Who, who here is a, um, a Java hacker in the audience? Raise your, raise your hand. Yeah, any Java hackers? One, there's one. <laughs> any shy Java hackers? Are you a Java hacker, Mateus? <laughs> so for folks who are developing on Java, what are their options for doing embedded development today? What can they actually like play with and build with? Well, I'll, I'll throw in what I think is the easiest. Uh, Raspbian now, as of the announcement was made at uh, Java One 2013, ooh, feedback, uh, that Raspbian uh, will ship with uh, the JDK. So you've got Java SE embedded that comes with every build of Raspbian that you can download from the Raspberry Pi uh, org. So that's a great place to start. And if you decide that you want to uh, look at ME, or if you decide to look at, uh, in, as in our case, we actually deployed uh, full Java Enterprise Edition with Glassfish 4, so the Java EE7 web profile, uh, you can build off of that. So I think it's a great place to start, very approachable, something that you're used to. Uh, the APIs that you're used to are already in place. You just install the OS, and you're off and running. Yeah, you can also um, start for, with, for example, a Java ME Embedded 8. With, for around 16 euros, you can buy a, a board from ST Microelectronics, which is supported by Java ME 8 Embedded. And uh, so this is just a tiny device. And, or you can also get devices from uh, Gmalto, which uh, have most of the time embedded uh, 3G connectivity. So that means you can build your device, put it somewhere, and add a SIM card to it, and then it can whatever, connect to the internet. And all these things are running on Java ME embedded. And then uh, you can use things like the QB board or, that I mentioned already. So all where you can run Raspbian, which, which is a Debian uh, Linux, there you can use JDK8 SE embedded. So it, that's really an easy start and really cheap. Cool. Actually, there is a... Um a problem with the Raspberry Pi is you cannot uh, load your usual or regular ID there because it's not so, <laughs> so powerful to, to run and open, for instance, NetBean or Eclipse or whatever. So the, uh, for now, uh, there are tools in, for instance, in NetBeans 8 beta, which you can download now, that allows you to uh, get to the Raspberry Pi, and, but running everything on your computer from your computer on the Raspberry Pi. So you can uh, not only deploy and send the, your programs, your jars, to the Raspberry Pi, but also you can debug from your, your computer on the Raspberry Pi, with it, which is very, very uh, useful when you are uh, deploying your program. So it's, it's like a, a really great tool for that. OK, you want to add last comment? Yeah, I, I mean, Raspberry Pi is really a nice platform, but I consider it being a good Internet of Things gateway, and then you could connect a yeah, bunch of so other you would, things. You would consider the small chips, the uh, those um, e endpoints, the real Internet of e Things. These are the really small endpoints. Could be your temperature sensors or things like that, humidity sensors, CO2 sensors, and then hook it up to your local Raspberry Pi and do some nice processing in Java and do some intelligent decision making, controlling your home. So that's 
That's one way of, of doing Internet of Things with Java. Or you build a bunch of devices using Raspberry Pis because they're cheap enough to, to actually use several of them. But if you would like to produce your temperature sensor smart device and then start production, you need to go down where Java is not yet. But I, I'm kind of trying each year at JFocus to tell Oracle that. Yeah, so uh, yes. Java keeps getting smaller. Yeah. And Java these, ME sits on really tiny chips now. Yeah, so I think there's hope. These devices get slightly larger. They've been moving from 8 bits to 32 bits ARM processors, so it's easier to scale up. And as Java is scaling down, soon they will meet, I hope. Then it's going to be much easier, because I, if we would like to see these 50 billion devices 2020, I think it's really important to get a higher level language on these devices, because we, we don't have enough low level C programmer. I think no one would really like to convert. So we need to get Java or similar onto these devices to truly scale up to this and, and make 50 billion devices before 2020. That's OK. So speaking of um, devices and gateway devices where you might want to have more interaction, we got a question on the stream. And it was how JavaFX enables IoT applications. <laughs> guess who it was from? Uh. <laughs> yeah, I am a guess. Yeah, so um, yeah, you can use JavaFX on, uh, on the Pi, for example. And uh, like you mentioned already, it's uh, the Pi. There is a great device working as a gateway or to visualize the data that it collects from a sensor network, for example. There you can use JavaFX really nicely. And there are other ports like uh, JavaFX on Android and on iOS, which are not officially supported. But um, I have actually this watch on my, on my wrist, which is running uh, Android. And I have a JavaFX application running on that watch. So um, that shows the capabilities. This is, like I said, this is just not, not official. And um, All right, so I think, I think you're, you're the first person we have here with wearable technology on our panel. Really? Wow. <laughs> it's not that uh, exciting anymore, right? So this stuff so, is available. Right, so why don't you talk a little bit more about the watch and what it is and how you the watch yeah, the, the, on the it. amazing stuff. This is the watch <laughs> I ordered from Hong Kong. It's 140 euros, so really not expensive. This is, a, in principle, a mobile phone completely. It's running uh, Android on an ARM 9 dual core, one gigahertz, so it's really impressive. And you have a touch device, and so you can really do a lot of things. It's amazing what you can do with such a cheap device, right? So if you can, uh, I don't know if you can show it. Oh, yeah. So let me switch it on. And yeah, it's, it's, I think it will be hard to see, but just let me take it off, and then I can show it to the camera. <laughs> so let me show this one. Just give it a second to boot up. And here we go. So this is a JavaFX application running on the, on the watch. And uh, as you can see, it's not that slow. So this is something I created in JavaFX. And uh, I, it's the same code I use on the desktop. I can also use on that watch. And I can, and can, I can also use it on my, for example, on my uh, iPad or whatever. So I have no data here because I'm not connected to the network. But you see that I can, uh, I can do these things, and the animations are quite smooth. So it's really nice to, to do that kind of stuff. Even the, the graphics are there. These are connected to my Pi at home. So it measures data from my Pi and visualizes it on the watch. So yeah, this is, um, that's 140 bucks, and it's really powerful. So you can do, uh, and this is also IoT, right? If you, if you, uh, if you be honest, then, Every smartphone, every iPad, it's ARM architecture. So that means it's, in principle, the same, just more powerful than these tiny devices. But the base is the same, and the idea is the same. So for me, it's the same thing. So mobile and embedded is, in principle, one thing, I guess. So that's my, my thought. So any of you guys up doing any UI work with IoT, user interfaces? Yes, yes. For our demo, we built, uh, in fact, uh, two, two UI, uh, UI clients, uh, one in JavaFX and one uh, with JavaScript. And 
the funny thing is that uh, with the help of the designs by, by Gerrit, it's very easy to run the JavaFX client on every device, and we run it, we run it also in the Raspberry Pi. So it's really easy to, to mix uh, the, the client with, with, the, with these devices, because though they are in the back end, you can build, you have plenty of uh, ways to, to communicate uh, the client with, the, with your back end, with your server. So with, with Java, you can do the full stack. You can go from the back end to, to, through the server to your client, and you can uh, wear a client, actually, or have your desktop or uh, your uh, any kind of device you want. So uh, with JavaFX, it's really easy to, to adapt and to, and, and to mix uh, all these uh, devices. One, th one thing you have to, to, to figure out is the way to communicate between each other. And, and you have two different uh, two, two main streams. One, getting the data, which is really easy. Get everything uh, from your sensors, all the readings, display in gauges or whatever you want. And the other thing is controlling real devices at home. So you have to establish uh, two ways to, to get in touch with your devices. One for readings and one actually for writing uh, on digital pins to trigger some uh, action at home. So it, from your, uh, with your client, you can do both things. And put some buttons, some uh, switches, or some, something like uh, Gerrit has shown, uh, to easily interact with your devices. It's, re it's really fun. OK, so we're, we're getting close to time when sessions are going to get back in. But I want to get the, the panel, our expert panels, Paul. So five years from now, how much of JFocus will be embedded? Because right now, we have a conference full of Java sessions, and there's a small embedded track. So five years from now, what's your prediction on JFocus embedded? It, that, that's a hard question. I would say that we will still at least have one track. But also, since I assume that we have more Java in many more embedded devices, it might actually pop into the general sessions like we had some Raspberry Pis on, on some performance testing. So I think maybe we, not, we might not consider splitting the topics anymore. So it might even merge into being more of the same. So of course, you will not run enterprise Java on an embedded system. But I think the, the, the programming the way to program an embedded system needs to be closer to actually programming your desktop or your mobile phone. So if, yeah, I, I kind of hope that it's rather going to merge in and, and to be part of the, part of it at least, going to be in the other sessions also. OK, I, I have to, uh, to agree with Joaquin for that. And the good thing uh, in five years' time, it, it would be that. that we don't need to, to talk about uh, something called IoT or embedded stuff because it would be uh, uh, so solid uh, to say that we are still talking about a new thing because in five years' time, it should be all embedded in, in our real lives. So I guess uh, it should be uh, another mainstream also, like the other ones right now. Yeah, I, I was going to say almost the same thing. In, in the uh, IoT keynote this morning, David mentioned that um, IoT, the Internet of Things, is really uh, machine, to machine computing for the common person, for the everyday person in the world. Uh, I think that as it becomes more pervasive, it will just be something that will be incorporated into every system. Uh, if you think about the number of wearable items or the number of wired or wireless, I should say, items, items that communicate... Uh, that we use daily already, it's, uh, it's kind of staggering, and that number is just going to go up. So I think it's going to take on a much larger role. I don't know that it's going to be talked about as much because it's going to be just an accepted part of everything we do. You got the last word, Garrett. Okay. So yeah, I think at the moment it's the hype, right? IoT is the hype. Every, everything is IoT. And in five years, my prediction is then it's just there and nobody talks about it anymore because it's, <laughs> because it's everywhere, right? It's just part of it. So then we have another hype. I don't know what it is, but... <laughs> the next big thing. Yes. And you'll, you'll be doing it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs>
Don't think so. <laughs> All right. So I want to thank my um, my panelists here for coming and doing the the panel here at J Focus. Um, and then our next session is going to be Rebia Gransberger and 50 minutes to talk about ID usage. So thanks very much, guys. And enjoy the next of the J Focus sessions. Come back during the next break, and we'll have another live stream. <laughs>